So today's question is, was Einstein right about gravity? Yes. Wait, 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 wait. We can't just say yes. Right? right. Okay. What we, what we need to know is, firstly, what did Einstein say about gravity? And to understand what Einstein said about gravity, I think we need to go back a few hundred years and understand what Newton said about gravity. So what Newton said about gravity was as follows. Uh, for any two masses in the universe, they will attract each other via a force. Okay? That force will be stronger the heavier they are, and it'll be stronger the closer the two objects are to each other, according to the square of the distance. So if you take, there's a certain force between two masses, if you take them half the distance from each other, the force is now four times as strong. It's a nice simple formula, the nice thing is what it explains. I understand that one of the great successes that Newton had, of course, was explaining the fact that the moon was held in its orbit by the force of gravity. But is is there a force of gravity between us? I'm not corresp- I'm not mentioning our masses, etc. But yeah, anything. I mean, there's a force between the coffee cup and and the board and every everything else in the universe. The thing that dominates gravity around here is, of course, the Earth which, while the centre of the Earth is 6,000 kilometres away, it does weigh an awful lot. Uh, yeah, let me see if I get this right. A, a million, 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 million kilograms. Or six million, million, million kilograms. Okay, so, so Newton basically says if you've got any masses, there's going to be a force between them. Mm-hmm. That force is what we call gravity, and that's basically what dominates the motion of the moon around the Earth, or, quite famously, the apple falling from the tree. Mm-hmm. So where does Einstein come into this story? There are a few puzzles left over from Newton. And one of them was, if I have two things of different masses, you know, uh, I- intuitively you think the heavier one falls faster. But actually when you look at things very closely, famously you know, Galileo supposedly dropped two different uh, shot balls of different masses out of the uh, Leaning Tower of Pisa. They hit the ground at the same time. They fall at the same rate. Supposedly, I mean, supposedly he did that experiment, but that's been observed many times. And actually, that's not something that fits nicely into Newton's theory. You have to sort of make some weird assumptions there. So it seems like there's a deeper... What assumptions do you have to make? You have to assume... So there's, there's two properties of any, any sort of thing with mass in our universe, okay? according to Newton. There's what you call the inertial mass, which is how hard something is to push. So imagine just you know an elephant on roller skates or something. It takes some effort to push it. There's also what you call the gravitational mass, which is how hard something is to lift. And in intuitively, those are the same sort of thing. But actually, in Newton's theory, those are two different properties, conceptually different properties. Yeah, I, I find it interesting um, that you know, I teach, I've taught classical mechanics, and when I had classical mechanics taught to me, that, it, as you said, it's intuitive that when you say mass, it just means mass. And you don't think right. it's gravitational mass or inertial mass, and that they could be different so what did einstein have to say about it so what einstein was looking for was some way of explaining why they had to be the same right in newton in that conceptual framework they could be different and they just happened to be the same so here was einstein's sort of genius that if actually gravity was simply the curvature of space-time itself and if things uh, being attracted by gravity, so to speak, was actually just the curvature of that space-time, then actually things would just follow straight lines through that space, regardless of their mass. And so the two shot balls dropping from the top of the uh, Leaning Tower of Pisa were just following their own straight paths through space-time, in, regardless of what their mass is. And so that kind of naturally explains why they fall in the same way. I think it's important to clarify here. Of course, when, I mean, we use phrases like curvature of space-time. Really, in, in, in all of this, there's, there's mathematics behind this, right? So it's not just a, a pretty picture in our head, but there are maths that you write down, and that maths in, includes curved space-time, and you can work out the equations of how an object travels through that curved space-time. So this is like when Einstein developed his general theory of relativity in the... Um, early 1910s. This is really what he did. He, he came up with this picture of space time as having some sort of geometric properties. Yeah, the wonderful thing, this was all all abstract, pure mathematics during the late 1800s, even the mid-1800s. And then suddenly, hey presto, it's describing the entire universe. 
But being scientists, we know that you can do mathematics till the cows come home. You have mm -hmm. to compare to reality, mm -hmm. right? So um, Einstein has this new picture of gravity, but there's no point having this new picture unless it does something better than Newton's picture of gravity. So observationally, what, what did he give us? So this was another sort of little leftover hole in Newton's theory. It described the solar system beautifully, almost. almost. Mercury just wasn't quite playing ball. So the orbits of the planets aren't perfect circles. They're slightly elongated, sort of ovals. And there's a question of where the long bit of the oval points in space. And actually what we found was that the, these ovals slightly shift in time. And Newton could account for that shift almost perfectly for all the planets, except for Mercury, where things were shifting slightly differently. And by slightly, I mean by tiny, tiny, tiny fractions of the orbit per century. But, but must point out, astronomers are great people. They can do really accurate measurements, yeah. which is how they notice this, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, We're the heroes of this story. Yeah, actually, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that shift, Newton couldn't quite account for it. And so there are sort of theories about how it could happen. Maybe there's another planet that we're missing called Vulcan. But as the evidence for Vulcan kept failing to turn up, we looked at, hey, maybe we need to uh, have a closer look at this theory of gravity we've got. So in Newton's theory, there was a problem. When Einstein looked at the orbit of Mercury, he found that he could successfully uh, explain this shift of the perihelion, as the, as the name is, how, how much mm. the, the big line in the oval moves around the sun. Mm. That was 1915. There was something else going on in the world in 1915, let me think. Oh, yes, World War I was raging, of mm -hmm. course. Um, so uh, to bolster the, the Einstein's theory, he needed more observations. Mm -hmm. And there was a prediction, of course, that within his, his framework that light itself would be deflected by the presence of a massive object. But mm. um, to detect this, you needed to see light pass the most massive object in the solar system, which, of course, is the sun. And you can only do that during an eclipse. And traveling around the world during World War I was rather tricky, so we had to wait until the end of the war. And that's when Eddington came onto the scene in 1919. So Eddington um, organized these expeditions to South America and to Africa. Mm -hmm. And the idea was to photograph the sun and look at the positions of stars during the, an eclipse. And if Einstein was right, you should expect to see very small changes in the position because the light rays passing the sun have been deflected. Mm. And of course, if you, if you uh, know the story, it was, it's a good old adventure story with, you know, uh, dealing with tropical climates and clouds coming in during the eclipse and all this kind of stuff. But the result, at least in Eddington's eyes, uh, and subsequently redone with other um, eclipses, including one here in Australia in 1922, I think it was, oh. yep, confirmed that Einstein's prediction for how much light has been deflected was correct. But there was another test. Do you remember that one? There's been a couple of other tests. The one I really like is if you send light upwards through uh, so just upwards in the earth's atmosphere in the earth's atmosphere it's getting further away from the gravitational distortion from the earth and what uh einstein's theory predicts is actually if you measure the wavelength of light down here versus up there it will be different the light as you could imagine light is sort of traveling sort of out of the well and it's sort of it redshifts as it get out as it gets out it gets to longer wavelengths there's less energy it's sort of got to use energy climbing out it's a terrible analogy but that'll do so it's a very clever experiment done uh where you take light uh from an atom and we know that when light comes out of an atom it comes out at the same frequency you'd put very loose terms you put one atom at the bottom of a really tall tower and you put another identical atom at the top of a really tall tower and then you have them both emit light and then you can compare whether the light is actually changed on its path to the top or whether it just doesn't care about the gravitational field at all and lo and behold einstein got that one right the redshift of light the stretching of that wavelength is exactly what einstein predicted yeah this is the famous pound repka experiment mm. there's one more which i really like as well and this is this notion of time dilation mm. that uh, time ticks differently in different gravitational fields and there's the famous experiment that people have done where they put clocks on board planes and they fly them around the earth and you have to worry about 
speed of the clocks relative to one another and their change in position in the Earth's gravitational field. Mm -hmm. And again, you find that Einstein is born out again, it, that the clock come back. They may have been in sync at the start. They're out of sync at the end. Mm -hmm. And we actually can do this in the solar system, which I think is pretty cool. Is if you fire uh, radar beams at the planet Venus, so you can bounce radar off Venus, as Venus gets close to the sun and you bounce in radar off Venus, mm. it takes longer and longer for the light to get back to you, the radar beam, because of this time dilation effect. So basically, there's this distortion in space-time and the, the, um, the radar beams are having to deal with this and that, can, that is seen as the signal taking longer and longer to get back as Venus gets closer and closer to the sun. So overall, it looks like Einstein's sort of view of gravity has been borne out. But there are problems, right? There's still a couple of mysteries around. One of the great ones, which we've known about since, I think, the 30s, Zwicky. Uh, Fritz Zwicky was a, a uh, Swiss astronomer. Yes. And what he pointed out was that uh, if you look at the way galaxies, the stars in galaxies go around, and you look at how fast they are moving as they get further away from the centre, and then you think about, okay, how much stuff is there in there to provide the gravitational pull to hold it all in, it seems like there isn't enough uh, matter in galaxies to hold them together. And now we come up with a with an interesting sort of uh, dilemma. Is it the case that there's more matter than we think there is? Like the, the Vulcan idea, maybe we're just missing some little planet near the sun and that's what explains Mercury. Or have we got our theory of gravity wrong again, just as we needed to change from Newton to Einstein to explain Mercury? Now, as we look on gravitational, on, on galactic scales, we need to change our theory again to account for these, uh, uh, the way that uh, galaxies rotate. Yeah. And I, th I think, I mean, we know where this story actually goes is that most astronomers think that this gravity not working on a large scale indicates that there's additional matter out there, dark matter, which mm. basically dominates the universe. But there is still a, a small voice in the community that says that maybe it is that we don't have a complete picture of gravity yet. Yeah, so one of the great advantages, one of the reasons why Einstein took over from Newton so easily with the Mercury case was that it was this wonderful, beautiful, simple theory which just explained the data nicely and was ready there to take over. So the question is, can we find another wonderful, beautiful, simple theory ready to take over from Einstein? Um, and I think what most astronomers would say is when they try to do this, let's try and just sort of fiddle around with the knobs and dials, actually the theory that would explain these uh, galaxies is a bit ugly and a bit cobbled together. These, these modified uh, Newtonian dynamics is what they're called, MOND. They're a bit ugly. They don't have the sort of elegance of Einstein. And so it seems like just sticking in a bit more matter is a, is a better idea. So I think coming back to the original question, was Einstein right about gravity? Hmm. I think the answer is, of course, is that he wasn't wrong. <laughs> It, his, uh, his ideas of gravity seem to work exceedingly well, but they might break down on large scales, or there's this dominant dark matter in the universe. And I think that's something we should talk about in the future.